Okay. Good afternoon, good evening, uh, depending on where you're joining us from. My name is Gavin Health, and I'm a senior expert on Central Asia at USIP. I'll be moderating today's uh, very interesting discussion. I'd like to thank all of you, uh, as well as our panelists, for taking time out of your busy summer schedule to be with us uh, for this very timely discussion. I'd also like to thank our co-hosts for today's discussion, our friends at the OXA Society for Central Asian Affairs. Um, a little bit of uh, uh, logistics. We invite all of you to take part in today's discussion by asking questions using a chat box function located just below the video player on the USIP event page. We ask that you please include your name and specify where you are joining us from in your questions. And you can engage with us uh, and each other on Twitter today with the hashtag uh, at USIP Central Asia. Um, as many of you know, USIP was founded uh, by the US Congress 35 years ago as an independent nonpartisan national institute with the goal of preventing, mitigating, and resolving violent conflict. Our work in Central Asia is organized under the US State Department C5 Plus One initiative and provides a format for dialogue and a platform for joint efforts to address common challenges faced by the United States and the five Central Asian republics. Um, from DC, we produce timely analysis and convene discussions like this on the key drivers of conflict and stability in Central Asia. Today's discussion uh, has really come from, I think, an observation that many have made um, uh, in uh, the last few weeks, um, looking at uh, events in Central Asia uh, over this year, which have seen an unusual wave of protests popping up in places that we don't typically see them in calm and stable Central Asian states. Uh, in January, Kazakhstan erupted with widespread violence. And in recent weeks, both Tajikistan and Uzbekistan uh, have seen popular protests um, in formerly autonomous regions of their countries, which surprised observers um, uh, and prompted governments to cut off internet access, um, prevent outside media from covering this story, and led to some um, harsh crackdowns. This spate of incidents appears to stem from regional leaders' failure to anticipate popular reactions to simple policy changes, um, a string of what some have called unforced errors uh, by Central Asian governments, followed by ha harsh overreactions um, in putting them down. Uh, today's event will try to pierce the veil of secrecy around some of these recent events in Central Asia. We have an excellent panel of scholars with us uh, to share their perspectives on these protests and to try and understand more broadly why governments in the region are suddenly struggling to keep things under control. Um, Suzanne Levy Sanchez is a non-resident fellow at American University School of International Service and a retired uh, associate professor of national security affairs at the U.S. Naval War College. Uh, she is the author of a number of publications, including the Afghan Central Asian Borderlands, the State and Local Leaders, uh, uh, and uh, Field Works as a Craft, a Practical Guide to Doing Research in the Real World. Um, Ivan uh, Kwisch is a Polish-Mexican doctoral candidate at the University of Tartu in Estonia. He holds a, an IM from the University of Glasgow and an MA from his current institution and has studied both in Moscow and Mexico City. He's also offered expert commentary on Russia's foreign policy and Central Asian international affairs to media such as BBC, France 24, and RFERL. And Asel Tutumlu is an associate professor at Near, Near East University, specializing in political economy uh, and regime leadership in Central Asia. So Suzanne and Yvonne have uh, personal experience working in both Gorno Badakhshan in Tajikistan and Karakal Pakistan in Uzbekistan, respectively, and will first offer us some background uh, on, and insight, hopefully, uh, into um, how these missteps, protests, and crackdowns came about. Um, I know that, uh, especially when things started to happen in Karakal Pakistan, a lot of us uh, who study Central Asia sort of looked at each other and said, you know, what's going on? Who knows anything about um, what's going on in Karakal Pakistan? So hopefully we'll get a little bit of insight um, into the background of these events. Um, and then Asel is going to help us understand um, 
what's going on with these governments and these systems and why things might be going the way they are. So um, first, uh, we'll go around and do uh, a round of presentations, and I'll start with uh, Suzanne, please. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Gavin. Um, I'm honored to be here among such great scholars, and I'm honored to be here with USIP. Thank you so much. Um, first, I want to just um, acknowledge the many uh, brave Pamiris, both in the locally and in the diaspora, who have um, stood up in various ways in a very difficult situation, and many have died or been arrested as a result of this, and many probably would be better uh, being here in my position, but they can't be for fear of their family or uh, some of them who are speaking up are um, have mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers and cousins being harassed, uh, detained, tortured, um, and looted. So just saying that right off the top, um, because I think it's important because it has been pretty intense. Um, second, I want to say one book that Gavin didn't mention is my newest book, and this book is only relevant because it actually has eight case studies on informal organizations in Gorno Badakhshan and Afghanistan, and all of the informal organizations were studied as a means to understand how a vibrant civil society functioned within an authoritarian state. Uh, most of them, during these recent protests and crackdowns, have been either killed, wiped out, or they're no, they're no longer existent. So it's important to understand that this, this book of many years of study is now almost erased. Um, but it's worth reading because it does, it helps to understand the, um, and I'm not trying to sell my book, but I think it is very relevant here um, because it does explain what the government is doing and why it's cracking down. So now just briefly, I'm gonna start, I have so many details floating in my head. I was trying to sort this out so I wouldn't, I somehow often go into the weeds and then it becomes, um, uh, you know, people don't know what I'm talking about. So I'm going to try to be succinct. Um, the crack, the, the recent protest started after uh, Golbadin Ziobekov was killed um, on, in November, November 25th, I believe. Um, and then there were four days of protests after that. But why did they kill Ziobekov at that time? So in, this is in Gorno Badakhshan. Um, the Zio Bekov had beat up a prosecutor, um, the local prosecutor, a year before. And uh, the, he had beaten him up because he harassed a local girl, local young woman. And I want to say that that's sort of traditionally what has happened. So this is, you know, these types of beating up and, and even minor protests to harassment of women in particular or various injustices have been occurring. It's very common there. It's just never reported. So that's, no, that's nothing new. And so everybody kind of this whole, you know, they knew Zia Beckoff might get arrested, et cetera. But then there was a change in the governor of the, the province from um, Yadgar Faizov to... Um, Mirzon Nabarov. And why does that matter? Because Faizov was stopping the arrest of Zia Bekov. But Mirzon Nabarov, the new governor, decided, no, we're going to go after him, and we're not going to allow this to happen. And he went after him, and he let the prosecutor, who had been beaten up, arrest him. And there are many reports of the prosecutor shooting Zia Bekov in the head in the car. So that started these protests because a lot of people witnessed that. And there were four days of protests, the government cracked down, and then things calmed down, which they usually do, because there were, you know, there were um, protests and government um, local conflict in 2012, 2014, 2018, and then this one. So th again, that's nothing new. It, 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 it sort of bubbles up, the government tries to take control, and then there's civil society and the government. The usual chain of events is the government and the civil society come to some sort of agreement about whatever has been brewing, which is what everybody thought was going to happen here. Um, so they 
the locals um, organized a group called Group 44 of local civil society leaders, and the um, government of Tajikistan allowed a commission that included some of those members, so that, and they were going to investigate the killing to see if it was justified or not because the Tajik government was saying he fought back with a gun and the locals were saying he didn't. So they were going to investigate that. But they never really investigated it. And then the prosecutors closed the case. So um, the internet was closed and shut down during this time. There were roadblocks between most of the little neighborhoods in Harok and people were getting more and more upset. Eventually, they turned on a very slow version of the internet a couple months later, and they still hadn't investigated it. They were arresting various people, harassing people, and so there was a new planned protest against these injustices. And that was announced May 14th, and then they did it May 16th. And um, Tajik government shot into the crowd. It, it got pretty out of hand. It was a peaceful protest that turned into a violent crackdown by the government. And then the Tajik government called in reinforcements. And those reinforcements drove through Vama Roshan, which is the neighboring district. And the Roshanis tried to block the road. There are many protesters then, and Roshanis historically have not gotten involved. They, they stay out of it. They don't. But the injustices that were happening in Kharok inspired a fairly large protest there, and the government cracked down. Um, the government has given figures of between uh, 8 and 21 that were killed, um, and the locals have said it's 40 or more that were killed. And then there were um, also numbers of 120 hostages taken. Um, there were there was looting. The security forces went door to door, and um, there were 17 cars taken from locals. It, it kind of went from there. Then um, the government decided, well, I guess we're going to go all in, which they had never done before. They always, for years, for at least 12 years, they wanted to take sort of the autonomous status away from the region, and they wanted to have full control. They had been unable to. Um, and just as a sidebar, part of the reason they'd been unable to is the gorno barakhshan Autonomous Oblast, the autonomy of the region was actually um, existed before the state of Tajikistan. So it was an, uh, Tajikistan was part of Uzbekistan at first as an ASSR, an autom autonomous Soviet socialist republic, which is and ended when the Soviet Union ended is what Karl Pakistan done, um, remained in ASSR, whereas gorno Barakhshan, once Tajikistan was separated and became its own state, no longer an ASSR, gorno Barakhshan kept its autonomous status as a province within the new Tajik SSR. Now, why is that? It's important as a sidebar because the delimitation of the entire Soviet Union was based you know, all the borders of the post-Soviet space are based on those borders. So you change any of them, all of these little border disputes between countries, you, you really question all of them. Uh, so it's not that easy for these, these uh, dictators to just take it away because it, it changes a lot of different things. Um, so back to the protests. So then after May 16th and after the massacre at Roshan, and I'm calling it a massacre because killing that many civilians in a protest is, is pretty extreme. Um, then they went after the most influential local leaders in Harok, and they they killed them. They killed them. Uh, one, the first one, Bukhir, Commander or Colonel Bukhir, um, on May 22nd. His full name is Mama Bukhir, Mama Bukhirov. And then they killed two others, and then they began arresting journalists human rights leaders, civil society leaders, business leaders, and they also nationalized most of the larger, if not all the large businesses in the region. They also destroyed the, the, the region is 
um, which I probably should have said right at the top, is populated by Hamiri Ismailis. Um, and they are a different religious and ethnic group than the center of Dushanbe. So they destroyed the Ismaili flag and they have replaced it with a welcome President Rahmon, um, the president of Tajikistan. And they have also closed down the Ismaili summer camps for children. And they have been slowly weaning away at the various religious, you know, they've arrested uh, local scholars who study Pamiri languages and culture, et cetera, et cetera. So um, after all of this and the mass arrests, the roadblocks, they're also, um, to add into this, and I'm almost done, is China um, uh, gave Tajikistan surveillance equipment and, and drone for this, um, in, you know, recent uh, crackdown. And so Tajikistan, as far as I know, and my sources have said, began to scoop up information. And the information that they would scoop up from conversations, because there were cameras and, and all the surveillance, uh, led them to begin to arrest lots of people that were in conversations or they felt were any sort of threat. Um, so basically, they've stripped civil society of the autonomy that is promised to the Tajiks in Article 6 of the Constitution, and that was an agreement after the Tajik civil society. Civil War. And from here, moving forward, right now, the area is somewhat leaderless. They are, um, they've, they've um, uh, given out mass evictions because they want to build new buildings. Uh, they are nationalizing um, the the bizarre businesses the, anyway all the many of the businesses are being nationalized um and they i guess what what used to be a way for the pamiris to assert justice was not perfect but it was you know if they harassed or raped a young woman or whatever they would beat up that person and that's kind of the way the justice was meted out. Now that there actually is, there's no higher level leaders, there's no civil society leaders left, and the youth um, are beginning to have less access to education. And you know, on top of all this, this issue of the Taliban takeover, there's been switching around of the drug trafficking, sort of who's controlling what. There's there's one main drug trafficking route that is now open, and that goes through Gornobarofshan. And then there's the interests of China and Russia. China wants that road open. They want that area secured because of the Uyghurs. And Russia um, views that area as part of the greater Russian space. Um, so they are happy the West is out, and they're happy that, that the um, uh, trade and traffic is now uh, without Western intervention. So I think that the um, the future is pretty bleak. I think the diaspora is um, the Pamiri diaspora is organized, and it, so the leadership is kind of switched to the intellectual uh, elite and activists within the Pamiri diaspora. And I I think you know they will continue from there. Um, and I think the youth the fear is that the youth would you know, if they have a lack of access to opportunities, education, et cetera, and you have this multi-billion dollar drug trade on the other side, along with all kinds of stuff, uh, you know, and there's no access to justice uh, mechanisms, it doesn't bode well for the youth. So um, I have a lot more to say. I'm sorry. I hope I didn't go too long. No, that's okay. I mean, we, we, uh, leave some for the question. <laughs> answer, but uh, that was a that was a great that was a great um, uh, introduction uh, to those tragic events. Now I want to turn to Yvonne. Um, you know the other uh, ethnic territorial unit in that Central Asia inherited from the Soviet Union is Karakal Pakistan uh, in Western Uzbekistan. Um, I, Yvonne, we a lot of us uh, 
I think a lot of us have, have been to maybe Karakal, Pakistan, but usually in connection with climate change and ecology and the RLC, and maybe, you know, um, you know, not really absorbed, uh, you know, what was going on politically. So I'd like to turn to you uh, for a little bit of background uh, uh, and insight into what you see as uh, sort of behind the events there. Certainly. Um, also, I want to echo what Susan said. First, my gratitude to be part of this plan of this excellent panel, and also echo my sentiment also that it would be fantastic for there to be voices from Karakal, Pakistan, be it from the diaspora, from the exile, or from the region itself. But of course, scholars, researchers, and activists in that area are under enormous pressure and have been for decades. So uh, nevertheless, I hope to contribute to this discussion. Um, with one caveat starting, I am I, uh, I approach the topic of Karakal, Pakistan, and Central Asian autonomy through my research on territorial autonomy in general, because my interest has been to try to understand what is territorial autonomy in non-democratic regimes. And Karakal, Pakistan is a, is a fascinating case because, well, for starters, there has been a very wide gap in the literature about what, what is uh, ter territorial autonomy in Karakal, Pakistan's case. Because the few accounts that we have of the political situation in Karakal, Pakistan are they point very succinctly to this territorial autonomy being a sham, being a superficial, being a, not giving effective autonomous decision-making faculties and rights for the authorities of Karakal, Pakistan uh, in relation to Tashkent. To say in other words, uh, Karakal, Pakistan does not govern itself autonomously from Tashkent. Many of the laws are handed down from Tashkent, so and and uh, and I can go on about uh, why this is the case. The leadership is selected from Tashkent and so on. This is a big contrast from other cases of territorial autonomy. Uh, just to point to one, the Orland Islands in 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 Europe. They, uh, they this is a case where you see the what can we expect from a territory from an autonomous territory. And the case of Karakal, Pakistan, we don't see that. What we do see, however, is the symbolic weight and power that the symbols of autonomy have in Karakal, Pakistan's case. Karakal, Pakistan has its own flag. It has its own uh, uh, legislative uh, authority and uh, its, uh, its own government system that is, in fact, different from Tashkent. It's a parliamentary and, uh, government, in, while Uzbekistan is more of a presidential system. So these are points to, to keep in mind. Now, uh, Karakal, Pakistan, like other territorial autonomies uh, of the region, they were created uh, to a great extent as a form of, um, of minority rights protection for the peoples living in that territory. In the case of Karakal, Pakistan, that's the Karakal, Pak people. Uh, this is an important point because they are, uh, like Uzbeks, they are Turkic speakers, but they speak a different branch of, of, of and it's a different subfamily or family of language. It's closer to that of Kazakhstan, while Uzbek language is closer to Uyghur language and, and other languages. So the, there's a degree of, of difference there. Um, so this is this I give as a general background. So we're all uh, on the same page with <clears throat> with the territorial autonomy status. Now uh, the current juncture happened because. Um, the, the new the president of Uzbekistan, Mr. Yoyev, he has pursued a, a, a style of government through reform. Uh, some have characterized this as uh, authoritarian upgrade, authoritarian modernization. And I emphasize here the, the point that it's authoritarian because while there has been a facade of uh, creating a new, creating a, a new Uzbekistan that is more democratic and more open, uh, decision-making remains very strongly concentrated in Tashkent, in, in Tashkent and in the president's authority. There have been some substantive improvements in human rights and, and uh, political rights, but political power remains in the hands of the president of Uzbekistan. And this is very visible in, in Karakal, Pakistan, and this was very visible in the recent uh, juncture 
where uh, the president, having been uh, given a new mandate, uh, decided to continue this style of governing through reforms, uh, uh, in, and in this case, uh, through the process of constitutional reform. Now, what happened immediately is that uh, in order to create this image of a uh, new Uzbekistan and new, um, more democratic uh, decision-making processes, the, the constitutional reform has been, there have been some processes of, um, how to call it, to, to call the opinions of the population for them to say, to have a say, uh, and supposedly to pitch ideas to how to change the constitution. Whether that process is uh, kind of faithful to the suggestions made, that's a different question. So there has been, nevertheless, this means that there has been a degree of transparency and a degree of um, uh, of, of openness that maybe would be different uh, in a different time. That would not have been the case maybe in a different time. Um, the immediate trigger of the of the protests that we that we saw recently was the publication of many of these changes in the Uzbek Constitution, and these changes were visible and substantive in two specific areas. One, in the removal and the potential removal of term limits for the president, and, and the other on the um, diminution of Karakal Pakistan's autonomy and the dilution of its autonomous status at the constitutional level. Once this became public, um, the information that we have of what happened specific or concretely on the ground of Karakal Pakistan is not known exactly. Uh, very few journalists have been able to go in and actually find out what, what, what is happening, what happened. What I have heard and, and read is that there were, there was a large spontaneous gatherings that formed uh, once this information became public. And uh, this, uh, there was, there were figures that emerged that as, uh, kind of, as kind of taking leadership, so to speak of this uh, otherwise a spontaneous movement of uh, protest against this, this constitutional change, and it was cracked down. There was no, that we know of, there was no attempt of dialogue, of reaching out to this leadership of, uh, or this spontaneous movement. There was no uh, attempt of uh, negotiation or any kind of dialogue. It was instead just shut down. At the same time, however, the constitutional amendment regarding Karakal Pakistan, at least, uh, the President of Uzbekistan, uh, Uzbekistan was very open in saying that it's not going to go forward. Uh, what has happened since is that Uzbekistan is, cut, uh, sorry, Karakal Pakistan is cut, cut off from the internet. There are some indications that maybe it is slowly coming back recently, but it's a matter of the last 24 hours maybe. And uh, there remains a lot of uncertainty about what precisely happened on those days. And uh, I should mention, why why the protests were so uh, um, important. I mentioned already the symbolic element, but I also should, I would be remiss if not mentioning uh, very real grievances in Karakal Pakistan that have been brewing for many years now. I would just mention two. Uh, like Gavin mentioned, the environmental element here is absolutely critical. The RLC disaster is has been shaping the lives of uh, people in Karakal Pakistan ever for decades and decades, even before independence. Because desertification comes with many, uh, not only kind of social and economic uh, consequences, but also health consequences. Tuberculosis is rampant in Karakal, Pakistan. And this topic has been mostly neglected by the authorities. Uh, there have been some measures here and there, some international cooperation, some adjustments uh, assisted by the authorities. But for the most part, People are on their own. Um, so this is one, one important source of, of grievance. The other important source is that Karakal Pakistan um, was incorporated into Uzbekistan on uh, the, kind of the political arrangement that has been in place between Karakal Pakistan and Uzbekistan comes from the 1990s, from the early 1990s. Um, there's a lot that is unknown about this arrangement, um, but what is known is that in 1993, uh, uh, Karakal Pakistan um, gave up any, any ambition of having a, a 
full autonomy or maybe even independence uh, from Uzbekistan um, in exchange of having uh, an autonomous territory and autonomous uh, rights within Uzbekistan and a referendum of independence to happen 20 years in the future. 2013 came and no such referendum was made. And there is some reports that suggest that people remember that. And that's also one grievance uh, kind of in the background. And just as a final thought, um, why now this reform? I mentioned the second mandate of Mr. Yoyev, and I think that's an important element. But I think also one, one point is that uh, uh, Karakalpakistan autonomy is known to be ineffective in the terms that I already mentioned. And uh, I imagine that Tashkent thought that uh, people won't mind if we take it away, that uh, people know that this is a sham, so what if we just happen to, to diminish it? That, that's a conjecture on, of my part, but I think it's also important to think about it. So thank you. Thank you, Ivan. And actually that, you know, um, your last statement that the government just thought nobody would notice um, or pay attention uh, leads into the question that, that I want to ask Asel to address, which is, you know, going back as far as um, the end of 2020 in Kyrgyzstan uh, with, you know, uh, manipulated elections uh, leading to public protests and uh, an overturn of the existing constitution um, in Kazakhstan with the um, increase in uh, liquid natural gas um, prices uh, in December leading to protests and then everything else that followed. Um, and then in Gonabarakshan and in Karakal, Pakistan, I mean, that's four of the five countries of Central Asia where we've seen a real miscalculation um, on the part of uh, what we thought were pretty smart, um, you know, um, governments that were, uh, that would be able to predict these things. So I want to ask you to address the question of the broader question of, you know, what's going on, what's going on in terms of it, uh, this post COVID uh, <laughs> um, uh, uh, stumbling uh, that's, that's, that's happened in the region that we've seen in these cases. So. Thank you so much, Gavin. Um, thank you again for inviting me. Um, and uh, uh, I'm also very, very happy to, to be on the panel um, and to, to offer insights on um, basically how authoritarian uh, politics are is organized within the region. Um, and what's interesting is that we are talking about um, regimes that are very different in nature, um, more controlling, more oppressive, less oppressive. Um, but at the same time, what, what was puzzling is that the the way they handled the protests um, were very much similar. The internet was cut off. Um, then there was, so to say, the chistka, the, the cleansing, um, uh, the uh, putting uh, the, the tortures, uh, putting opposition into, into prisons or killing them, um, and uh, uh, basically then opening up and inviting some international observers, uh, some media to basically say that uh, here we are, uh, now everything is nice and well. Uh, and uh, to me, um, and I'm coming into this topic as a, as a political scientist of so regime theory, um, to me, it was um, um, also puzzling, but at the same time, not as much. So I want to start with the um, division, I think, a very important distinction between uh, regime and um, the state. Um, because um, I think this is uh, very important to understand that the security of the state is the security of the regime, actually. Um, and uh, as a result of that, we need to understand how the regime actually operates, um, how regime uses state institutions, what is its relations with the with the population. Um, and uh, as a model of analysis, or as a, or as a perspective, I think uh, uh, Balin Magyar's book called with a very colorful name called Mafia State um, that described the politics in Hungary actually fits uh, nicely here. Um, he describes the Mafia State as a regime where concentration of political power and expansion of wealth of the, so to say, adopted political family um, is the purpose of governance. 
Um, and we also see that the whole structure of bureaucratic organization and the state institutions um, is established um, and controlled by certain kinship and loyalty connections. Um, and it creates a kind of a division of, in the pyramidal fashion, it creates, uh, it creates divisions of um, labor, or we would say uh, access to resources. Um, and so uh, in contrast to the previous interpretations where we simply blamed the post-Soviet rulers uh, for corrupt decision-making, for very uh, kind of selfish uh, decision-making, instead, mafia state actually uh, offers us a very kind of purposeful, legitimate um, participation of special interests in legislative measures and governance. Um, and so therefore he calls, uh, and I quote here, the mafia state is the privatized form of a parasite state. Um, and it was intriguing to me and interesting simply because uh, the tactics that are used both to govern, to distribute resources, to deal with the op uh, opposition um, are actually very similar. Um, and the, uh, the reasons why um, the, the tactics are so brutal because uh, these regimes uh, have a lot to lose. Um, so if we take a look the way how domestically they're organized, the political economy of these particular regimes, not only that they are rentier states or they're based, uh, they're deriving their income from rents, but actually what they're doing is that they are securing power and loyalty uh, by putting certain people into the income streams. And when these income streams are controlled by these loyal people in exchange, obviously, for not only loyalty, but uh, for the distribution of rents and distribution of support and participation in different other uh, mechanisms, we have that um, the, the situation becomes very dire for, for uh, people who are not participating or who are not getting access to these income streams. Um, and particularly, I think that was the, the reason why in Kazakhstan there was such a strong anti-Nazarbayev rhetoric um, saying that the old man get out, um, again, because everyone was very much tired of that situation, the insular uh, ruling elite that pretty much controlled most of the assets. And it's uh, happening in a relatively similar manner uh, with different degrees of uh, uh, co political control in, in most of the countries of Central Asia. Um, and so then we have uh, the, the activists who actually try, or the people who, who try to voice their opinions, um, they are facing this mafia-like tactics uh, against the people. So the activists uh, are basically... Um, you know, put in prison, uh, have the administrative fines, they are co-opted. Um, and as a result of that, politics itself becomes highly performative. So even if people are speaking on behalf or raising these issues, there is no, there is such a strong distrust among the people um, against these particular individuals uh, because they, the, the skepticism runs very high and there are no other institutions. And so it was um, interesting to see in the case uh, and hear that in the case of uh, Tajikistan, there were people at least who were very vocal. Um, they, were, they may not have carried political, very strong political uh, messages, but at the same time they were leaders. But in, in Kazakhstani events, they... There were no leaders. And we can see the same, that it was very difficult to identify um, in Karakal, Pakistan, a, 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 a person who would actually embody this uh, public trust and uh, public voice, so to say. Um, and so as a result of that, we have this system that operates in a way that um, the politics is merged with economic, financial, and industrial groups. Um, and you have very loyal bureaucrats who are uh, governing, actually, the country. Um, and so in this sense, the mafia state remains um, in operation um, and secures the apparatus of governing or, or the power and also the, the political economy, the access to, to rents. And it's a very difficult way to, in this system the, in, that insulates and isolates uh, people away from the governing regime, the, we also see a very strong asymmetry of information. Um, so nobody really knows at the top, whoever governs at the top, nobody really knows what actually is happening at the local level. Uh, and that information asymmetry uh, creates certain impediments for reacting or preempting, let's say, uh, um, different um, 
atrocities. Um, so particularly the uh, people at the bottom, people uh, who are governing at the local level, who actually possess the whole information, they they are the ones who are framing um, how to think of the story um, to the uh, people in about in hierarchy. And so you have this, um, what we notice is, is a, a is not necessarily maybe a personality cult in, in the sense of uh, um, Hitler, Stalin, or Putin, but what we see is that um, it establishes a system in which the president becomes the only decision-making authority, um, but all of the um, bribes, corruption, violence, and so on is actually happening at the local level. Um, and so they shift the responsibility uh, from their own um, from, from their own actions and practices um, to say that, uh, well, the president basically allows us to engage in something like that. Um, and this asymmetry, uh, uh, asymmetry of information also results in the fact that uh, the regime doesn't really know what are the problems. And here I actually agree with Ivan very much so that uh, nobody really... Uh, the regime in Tashkent, Mirziyoy, probably didn't even know what exactly is the life uh, like in Nukus um, for, for people who are living not only under strong environmental pressure, but also very isolated um, economic links as well. So it's, it's a very difficult place to, to, to live in general. And same thing about uh, Gordon Badakhshan, which is... Um, also very much isolated and uh, uh, from the rest of the country um, and also possesses a large territory uh, in the comparative uh, terms. Um, and you also have the internal informal uh, practices at the local level that are really undermining the people's benefits and uh, or people's rights, people's uh, aspirations to better life in general because uh, um, there is constantly this opportunities for extortions, there's pressure, um, both formal and informal, and there is very strong insecurity. Um, so all of that, I think, puts the, um, puts the situation in a way that the regimes may have or may think that they have uh, relative control over the population uh, by eliminating leaders, by eliminating opposition, by controlling the courts, by controlling the army and the police. But in practice, what happens is that these leaderless uh, people, they continue to organize in some way. And when the understanding of just injustices reaches a certain level, then it becomes very difficult to control. Uh, and the regime becomes very surprised because they have no opportunity to hear these voices uh, in advance, to be able to prevent, accommodate, um, and actually not to include, for example, that clause uh, that wipes out the, uh, the autonomous status of, uh, of Karakal Pakistan, for example. Uh, so all of that uh, gives us an, an impression that in times when the, asymmetric, the information asymmetry is so difficult and so, so, so vast, um, the regime does the only thing they know best uh, is to repress. Um, so that's what explains, in my mind, the, the, the tactics that were relatively similar, despite the differences in the structure or the uh, uh, nature of, uh, authoritarian, of, of oppression in these authoritarian regimes. Uh, thank, thanks, Asel. Um, I just want to remind everybody that um, you can participate um, in today's discussion by asking questions. Um, in the uh, chat box function located below the viewing window. Um, and we'll try to get to those if we've got good ones. Let me, um, well, let me first ask uh, kind of in a round robin. Um, uh, it's, it's interesting, Asel, because um, in, in some cases, we've, we've heard terms like the listening state, um, uh, which would sound a little bit different than, than what you've described. And I would say, um, you know, what you're describing isn't new in 2022. Um, you know, this has been true since perhaps even, you could even apply that um, 
in the Soviet Union, I think, <laughs> you know, whether you're looking at, um, you know, replacing uh, Kunayev with Kolbin back in 1986, you know, again, a regime that's not aware of what's going to get it in trouble. But we've seen, I think, in Central Asia, a, a, a usual approach that also includes being smart about buying off um, discontent when it appears, um, you know, if people are striking because of economic problems, you give them a small raise and, you know, hopefully that will improve it or build a stadium or, you know, do something. So, um, so I'm curious and, and I'll throw this out to everyone. Has something changed in the, in, in the math around what people's reaction is going to be? Has something changed on the, on the population side? Um, we've seen events like this in Kyrgyzstan several times where economic revolts turn into political change. But this is very this is pretty rare in 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 the rest of Central Asia. So I want to throw that out. Is there is there something about the popular reaction that's a different math than before? Asel, do you want to take a shot at that first? Sure. Um, so yes, we definitely see the societal changes, um, particularly if you look at the Oxford, uh, oh, sorry, Oxus uh, uh, tracker, protest tracker. You do, we do notice uh, a very strong and significant uh, rise of protests in 2019, and most of them were actually in Kazakhstan. Um, uh, I haven't seen the research that actually puts the, the nature of protests uh, and the types of protests with the um, amounts of. Um, money that was distributed among the people through different state programs. Uh, but we could, de we could definitely say that um, in the uh, 2000s and 2000, early 2010s, um, there were many more state programs to support, um, to support the people. And slowly, they were taken away one by one. So uh, we have had, um, uh, for example, uh, programs that would support uh, uh, mothers that gave birth to children, um, uh, programs that would support uh, uh, with housing, uh, young families with housing. So there were many different um, uh, things that were available. And slowly, these programs became less accessible. So there were still many in nature, but they were less accessible. And suddenly, uh, the, um, on top of that, um, most of the population um, acquired debt. Um, and so this indebtedness and the lack of opportunities where what, with what were considered to be the basic needs of such as housing, education, for example, healthcare, that became suddenly unaffordable um, was also the result of, uh, uh, of, of the fact that people were simply angry because they compared their life and their future uh, to people who were belonging to this internal cycle, uh, circle, so to say, um, getting tons of money. Uh, I mean, we have a situation where I think it was KPMG, who, uh, the, the agency that um, said that 162 people control 50% of Kazakhstani wealth. So obviously that became so atrocious that no longer the, the, um, the control over resources was no longer enough for these people, but they were actually interfering with the lives of the average um, average people and uh, medium-sized businesses, uh, which didn't happen before. Before, I think when I when I was I was doing uh, my PhD research, for example, in uh, two thousands, um, the top. Uh, so to say, you 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 came to the radar if your business made five million dollars. Um, and now you come to the radar when your business makes only hundred thousand dollars a year. So that means uh, slowly we are getting into a situation in which it is indeed very difficult to make a living. Um, and uh, where this threshold stands in particular, it's very difficult to tell, but there was a realization, a very strong one, that this is not how we want to live and this is not how we want where we want to go. Uh, Suzanne. Thanks for those great uh, presentations, Ivan and myself. Incredibly informative. Um, I, you know, I come at it a very different angle than um, Asal in particular, because I study informal organizations and the positive impacts on the state um, in particular, and how informal organizations provide a buffer uh, between civil society and the state when civil society is co-opted by the state as an arm of the security services or an authoritarian reach. So 
my years of study was looking at how these different groups could function um, within that. And so I think different from Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan, for me, it's not about, oh, these protests are new. It's more about, oh, the protests have been there, but the crackdowns and the reaction by the government is radically different. And so when I look at that, well, why is the government so radically different in the crackdowns in this region? So I'm just going to say, because I should have read at the top, Gorno Barakhshan is almost half the territory of Tajikistan. It only has 3 percent arable land. It only has 250,000 people of the 9 million population. It is mountainous. It is hard to get to and it's extremely cold in the winter um, when I've been there. And so it's often been um, an area in which the Tajik government is kind of like, we want to control it, but it's over there. But after the Civil War, there were agreements between various leaders throughout the country as reconciliation that they would have a say in the government and there was a shared space. So the Tajik government slowly whittled away at that and killed various leaders in different regions. And then it attempted to do that officially for the first time in 2012 in Korno Barakhshan. Um, and that's that's the first time they tried to kill Commander Bokir, and they killed another leader, Imam Nazara. Um, I say that because those crackdowns were attempts by the government to uh, strip the area of what was promised after the Civil War, as well as a low sort of soft um, de-autonomization of the region. That did not occur. So with autonomy, uh, you know, Yvonne was talking about what rights the autonomy was um, given for Kal Pakistan. In Gorno Badakhshan, the rights are that there was sort of an um, unwritten agreement that the local leaders could have a certain percentage of the trade and traffic that came through the region, and then they would redistribute it to the population. And then those would be renegotiated over time. So in 2014, when one of the fights happened, two of the leaders were called, and that was a renegotiation of the terms. And instead of a renegotiation, they killed and shot at the local leaders. Two of them died, and one was hospitalized. He's now arrested. Um, so why now? I, you know, this is my own analysis and speculation, but I think now um, you have the Taliban takeover. You have, um, you have, there was a meeting between Putin and Rahman that occurred right before the major crackdown. Historically, there has been within the FSB in Russia a sort of quiet support of the Pamiris on one level, because Russia often plays both sides. And somehow there was a discussion, and from what I understand, and I have several sources saying this, that there was a green light given to go full tilt in there. There's also the issue of China wanting that road, the Pamir Highway, which goes through the region and is the main route both to China and to Osh, to be cleared and controlled. And so in order to do that, they had to strip the area of the autonomous region without doing it legally. And the way to do that is to, to really purge all of the activist leaders, anybody that might be able to lay claim to that at this point. I think what Asal says in terms of the leaderless youth, and eventually something's going to happen there, they're going to grow up. Who knows what's going to happen? So, But I do think that there's all these sort of intervening variables. The last thing I'll say is that Botken is um, another trafficking route. So there's two main trafficking routes coming through Tajikistan. And because of the Kyrgyz-Tajik fighting, that one trafficking route has shifted. We also have Rustam Imam Ali, who is the president's son, who's being groomed to take over. And he became in charge of the Gorno Barakhshan route. And since that became a primary route, they also needed to clear it not only for China, but also for the drug trafficking into Osh. 
And no, OSH is part of Kyrgyzstan, but they have separate agreements on that side of the country, so it's still going. So those are all very important reasons for the crackdown, um, a lot of them economic, actually. So sorry for the long-winded again. Um, Yvonne, did you have any you have any thoughts on sort of the the population side of the question and whether the math has changed? I think I can only echo the points on the on the economic situation. Um, part of the new new Uzbekistan government messaging is that the country will will not rely on on autarky and uh, repression and kind of highly centralized power, but more on rising living standards for its legitimation. That plan kind of was. Uh, began to be very effective in the very first years with so very high GDP growth, but then COVID uh, uh, impeded a lot of that growth. We saw a big rebound in 2021, and now again it's uh, in question whether that promise can be kept. So I think there was, there may be at play as a kind of raising expectations, uh, at the very least when it comes to the the, the, the people wanting the government to match its lofty rhetoric about uh, economic growth and, and standard, standards of living. So I think that that is one one factor potentially at play also that that pushed people into into the protesting. So we've got a lot of questions which um, actually point to another aspect of this, which is this is obviously happening uh, in a context. Um, a strategic, geostrategic, um, great power competition uh, context that's really changed a lot in the last year. One of the things, interestingly, nobody's mentioned um, in all of these cases. In, in addition to cutting off the internet and um, getting, you know, keeping journalists out and and repression, was also a very quick um, response to blame um, external forces. Uh, you know, well-trained external forces uh, from outside, um, unnamed. Uh, but you know, maybe those external forces are also part of what's what's happening in terms of um, you know Russia and the war in Ukraine, um, the diminution of Russian military presence uh, and influence, uh, the return of the Taliban, and fears about what's happening in Afghanistan. And I wanted to throw that out. Um, you know, how do you think? Those events um, in Russia and in 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 um, Afghanistan, and then also obviously China's increasing concern about security issues is 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 playing into this. Anyone? Maybe can I jump in? Yep. Uh, I think when it comes to uh, Kalpakistan, I haven't really made up my mind what's the weight of this uh, kind of contextual international factors. But I can mention a, a couple of things that are uh, to be kept in mind when it comes to this case in particular. Um, there's the exile opposition, the Karakalpak opposition that would like autonomy to be real or maybe even independence of, of Karakalpakistan. And this movement had a, um, a, second, a second breath of life in 2014, in fact, following the Russia's annexation of Crimea, um, because they were, in fact, some of them, at least, were uh, asking for, or petitioning, or kind of advocating for Russia to to incorporate Karakalpakstan, which sounds kind of outlandish given that there's no contiguous land border. But Karakalpakstan was briefly in the 1930s part of uh, the Russian Socialist uh, Soviet Republic that was uh, within the context of within the framework of the broader Soviet Union. So they were kind of advocating for that. I, I don't think this really makes them kind of pro-Putinist or, or pro-Russia in that sense necessarily. I think just uh, a, a path that they saw as, as viable back then. I don't think today with the tarnished image of, of Russia because of its uh, war of aggression against Ukraine, I think that, that path is closed for now. Um, so that's one factor to consider. The other factor is that Kalpakistan was also at some point part of uh, what what became today uh, the state of Kazakhstan. Uh, and like I mentioned in, in, in my presentation, the, uh, the uh, ethnic Kalpaks are 
closer linguistically to Kazakhs than to Uzbeks. Plus, there is also a fairly substantial uh, Kazakh population in Karakalpakistan. So these are all factors that are probably in, uh, uh, present, at least in the, in the background of uh, Tashkent's decision making when it comes to, to Karakalpakistan, that there could be a latent conflict uh, with the, the northern neighbor. So, but again, how this plays into the into the current juncture, I haven't made up my mind. Uh, frank, and frankly, I don't see uh, it having a direct impact. But these are things to consider. Asel or Suzanne? Asel. Yeah, I can go through. Um, to me, it's also. I mean, I mean, I'm speaking also from the from the perspective of, of a Kazakh government. Um, what happens in Ukraine, um, obviously is the similar scenario that Russia used uh, pretty much uh, for Transnistria, from for Georgia. Um, and it's a tool uh, to keep the regime uh, loyal. Um, and I think it was... Um, it, it was important, or me as well. I uh, like Ivan. I haven't actually made up my mind for sure about it, but it's also potentially important to consider that having a unified state um, may be more important um, for the existing regimes um, because if they have these divisions, uh, even the legal ones, um, uh, even if in practice they do not necessarily mean anything, uh, Russia can use that against, against them uh, by supporting certain speakers, supporting certain cultures, um, and basically taking out territories. Um, this may not necessarily be as... Uh, uh, important for, for Kazakhstan, but we have an opposite situation. We have the majority of uh, Russian speakers are at the, in the north and Slavic speakers, the, the, the Slavic, um, ethnically Slavic uh, Kazakhstanis, uh, they live in the north, but they don't have official autonomy. Um, and, and so then, uh, um, but, but in, in both ways, I mean, in both situations, you may have official autonomy without actually um, de facto rights, uh, or you may have uh, differences, ethnic differences, without the official autonomy. In all these, both of these uh, solutions, in both of these situations, I think uh, all Central Asian regimes are highly vulnerable to that type of uh, instruments that Russia uses to discipline the near abroad regimes. Suzanne, did you have anything on that that you wanted to talk about? Yeah, just trying to sort out my thoughts on <laughs> on the geostrategic uh, overwhelm in the region at the moment. So, yeah. um, you know, well, okay, um, I think in terms of Ramon's regime and and Gorno Barafshan and then the larger political situation, I think, I think Ramon, President Ramon probably tried to com convince Putin in the past to support a um, more intense crackdown in Gorno-Bashan, but did not have the support. But I think with Ukraine, as well as a paranoia about potential instability that he couldn't control in Central Asia, because um, of all these protests and all these things, Ramon was able to finally convince both that Aga Khan Foundation, Western organizations were going to come back if it was unstable, and he had to crack it down to keep things under control and unstable. That's one thing. The second thing is when the West left the drug trafficking routes, and, you know, this is some speculation, but from years of uh, research on this topic, um, the drug trafficking sort of um, mm, geostrategic involvement shifted. So that means Russia had a piece of the pie in um, Afghanistan. There was support from China and Russia for the Taliban to be a stable government. Um, even though Tajikistan said, we're supporting the Tajiks, there was quiet um, cooperation with the Taliban because um, the drug trafficking and other types of trade and uh, continued. And from what I understand, actually, trade increased after a bit. Um, so there's all of that. Um, and then I think that, that China, because of the Western withdrawal and the desire to control what it views as the greater Chinese space, 
that includes Uyghurs on down through the Wuhan and all of that territory, which, I, you know, there's conspiracy theory among the Pamiris um, that all of that land is going to be given to China um, as to pay off the current $3 billion debt that they owe. I personally do not think that's what's going to happen. I think what's going to happen is that uh, Tajikistan is going to allow um, access and increase in trade routes and increase in whatever. Um, I do know that as soon as the crackdown finished and as soon as many of the leaders were taken out, there was $200 million given for infrastructure by the Chinese government to revamp the Pamir Highway, a.k.a. the heroin highway, which is the highway that goes to China and Osh. So China's involvement is not no longer as invisible as it once was. And then there's new bases from China. So I'd say, in a nutshell, Russia wants the area to become stable because it has economic interests as well as political um, ideas about Central Asia. And then, um, and so that supported the regime in this recent crackdown. And then uh, China also, while it hasn't been public about it, has provided surveillance equipment, drones, and other things to make sure this actually happens. So that, and there's there's sort of this also the um, ethnic and religious persecution part of this, which is going on in the Uyghur areas as well. So, um, so there you go. And I think that the protests which occurred will not be able to happen anymore like they have. The, those the the civil society has been stripped of that part of its independence in the region, um, in my opinion. Um, but I do think that they, given that they've had decades of sort of this undercurrent of um, hidden civil society um, agency, they they there is a likelihood that they will find a different a way. If that makes sense. I hope that answered the question. Um, I, I actually, you know, I, I, I take the point of um, uh, the the sort of Chinese techno authoritarian nature of some of these crackdowns. That it, it echoes certainly what we've seen um, in in Xinjiang uh, as well, and not in a pleasant way. Um, the other weird echo uh, that I want to throw out is. You know, I'm for for some of us who are old Sovietologists, we all remember um, that the, these these autonomous territorial units were created in the Soviet Union. They were part of, you know, Vladimir Lenin's um, de-imperialization of the of the czarist regime, which was a unitary state. Um, it didn't have a Ukrainian. It had regions, and the regions had different people living in them, but they were territorial units as part of the state. Vladimir Putin, uh, in February, on the eve of of his invasion of Ukraine, um, basically argued that that was illegitimate. That you know the creation of those ethnic territorial units, like the Ukraine. Um, as a as a union republic was an illegitimate importation of Western ideology, um, uh, and that that they were illegitimate as the basis of of independent states. That seems to be um, you know a negation of the entire basis on which the Soviet Union fell apart and the the successor states were created. But do you think that what's happening here with the two autonomies of of um, Central Asia is some kind of an echo of that? Um, you know, the, 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 uh, you know, how, how does that, how does that fit into what's going on? Go ahead. I'll take a crack at that one. Um, I, I, well, anecdotally in 2014 in May, after the, the fighting and whatnot, there was a group of women that had a petition and they were walking around and the petition was to secede from Tajikistan and uh, have Gorno Barakhshan join Russia. And that was that when Russia went into Crimea, it was during that whole period. So there was a very active Russian campaign to sort of what belongs to Russia. And the local commanders threatened to kill them and said, are you kidding? We're not separating from Tajikistan and joining Russia. So ironically, it was the local leaders that stopped this uh, secession Petition, and I think that um, now uh, 
if I look back on that, um, you know, Russia supported that and viewed gorno barashan as part of Russia and not as an autonomous region. And so I do kind of wonder now, um, is Putin's larger narrative of this all belongs to Russia um, part of this? And did Ramon, President Ramon, um, play on Putin's fears that there might be sort of a secession or some kind of separation? Um, I don't know. It's all speculation. But I do, I mean, that's that. what he said on February 23rd, um, again, completely negates what is understood about how the Soviet Union was formed and <laughs> all this current states. It's just kind of what, what? And, and so, I, you know, I do wonder if that's why suddenly the, the turnabout of support for cracking down on any forms of autonomy pro provides a legitimacy for his operations in Ukraine. I mean, I do wonder that. I don't have evidence of it. But you do have to wonder. And I think I think on top of that, I just say, you know, China's doing the same thing. China's cracking down on the Uyghur, Taiwan, you know, every area that is not fully incorporated into China, China's cracking down. And you kind of wonder if, you know, you look at Turkestan way back when, and there was the division between China and Russia back then. I mean, during sort of at the beginning of the great game. And I just wonder, are they looking at the borders and deciding almost like a new Sykes Peacock, you know, you get this area and you get this area? Um, because that's kind of what it's looking like, you know, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Um, Yvonne, I want to give you a chance to respond to that since this is your particular area of, of study. Uh, I think at this point I can also only speculate. It would be fascinating to to be a fly on the wall, so to speak, when the fateful decision was made to uh, in Tashkent to to uh, close down the, the Karakalpakstan Karakalpakstan's autonomy, what were what were the the arguments raised? What were the points raised? Is there an echo of uh, Putin's narrative of um, gathering the lands uh, uh, also at play in, in Uzbekistan when it comes to Karakalpakstan? Uh, kind of a sense of uh, possession and entitlement, saying that uh, this territorial autonomy and this status is uh, a hindrance for unifying the, uh, our country. Or it could be something along those lines. Um, I, I think I personally would lean through dif different explanations, but I do wonder. I do wonder. Okay. And finally, Yassel, do you have any uh, any thoughts on that? Well, I just want to say that... Um, um... The Soviet Union itself was uh, had a, a very um, imperial tactic of divisions, um, and uh, as a result of that, I think uh, Putin is basically reviving the similar type of imperial with similar imperial attitude. Um, uh, is trying to revive the the opportunities um, to reconsider or question the existing territories um, uh, by uh, claiming that uh, uh, Russia basically created the states, uh, created the stands, um, civilized them, modernized them, uh, created, so to say, modern roads and production processes and so on. Um, so the, the, the Soviet Union was already, it, it's, it's, planted the seeds of unrest already. I mean, we can look at the enclaves, we can look at the water energy nexus that existed before long ago, um, uh, ethnic, ethnic grounds, uh, as well as uh, the idea of titular nation. And the titular nation implies that all of these particular units, um, the Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, should have certain people who should be in charge. Uh, and uh, uh, as a result of that, it already gave opportunity to for titular majority uh, to, basic, to basically say that we are here, we are, you are in our house, you are a guest basically in our house to most of the mi minorities. And if minorities didn't like it, uh, obviously there was this attitude that you are free to go that you don't belong. So um, within the uh, Soviet division, 
um, both the territorial division but also nationality policy, um, the the conflict was already embedded. And I think what we're seeing uh, is this resolve or unresolve uh, of the conflicts of that historical era. Okay. Um, well, we're we're right at time. I want to thank um, all of you, my panelists, uh, for what was a really interesting um, and broad-ranging discussion. Uh, I think we might have stimulated some, some thought around these issues uh, that will be important going forward. Uh, and to all of the participants and those of you who asked questions, um, we want to thank you uh, for joining us today. Uh, and we'll see you next time. Have a good summer. Thank you so much.